Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, dear students. Uh, welcome to this uh, inaugural lecture, uh, dear colleagues. Since 2012, we have uh, developed this practice of starting the new academic year with a lecture given by a distinguished anthropologist from our field. The list of scholars we have had the honor to welcome in Leuven is long and impressive. And I just want to maybe give you a reminder again. So we started with Johannes Fabian, we then invited Tim Ingold, Thomas Hieland Eriksen, Faye Ginsberg, Paul Stoller, Henrietta Moore, Sherry Ordner, Laila Bulohot, Anand Pandyan, and today we have the pleasure of welcoming Professor uh, Nadia Seremetakis. Thank you for making it all the way to Leuven. With these inaugural lectures, our objective is to offer an introduction into the main questions uh, of our discipline to the newly arriving and settled uh, students. One of the strengths of anthropology as a discipline lies in its capacity to perpetually address grand questions and continuously regenerate itself from and throughout the various crises it has undergone. The result is a discipline that is highly reflexive about its own contours and limits and which offers a unique and critical view into our rapidly changing world through the practice of ethnography. We like to think that these inaugural lectures help us to identify some of those big questions that are at stake today, while at the same time trying to offer an intellectual genealogy and lineage to the discipline. But to introduce today's distinguished lecturer, Professor Nadia Seremetakis, I would like to invite my colleague, Professor Patrick de Vlieger, to the front, as he will be presenting the main threats in the impressive intellectual oeuvre of our guest. Good evening, um, everyone. Welcome. The purpose, as my colleague uh, Nadia Fadil already mentioned, is um, is, is for, for an inaugural lecture to give students a first taste of anthropology. And what better way to do this than to introduce an accomplished anthropologist who also focused on the census. The work of Nadia Serimitakis should definitely be read as anthropology, overall anthropology, not just a subdiscipline of anthropology like it's sometimes called the anthropology of the census. Her work is always biographically inspired. This anthropology happens between Greece and the United States as she was one of the first Greek women to be trained as an anthropologist in the US. It also happens between the United States and Greece, in which she endeavored to introduce anthropology and ethnography into the Greek academic landscape. And maybe she's going to tell us a little bit more about that. This fieldwork mobility provides a depth and complexity to the work and it shows in different types of writing and scholarship that balances between ethnographic explication, theory, and reflexivity. Nadia Sirimitakis received a BA and MA in sociology and an MA and PhD in cultural anthropology. But she became also very engaged in the area of cultural studies. There are th therefore three disciplines at work here that transpire in all of her work, namely sociology, anthropology, and cultural studies. Her writing is academic and also extends into poetry. It's academic and also applied public anthropology, as she worked as an advisor in the area of health. No wonder that she is not only claimed by academics, and many times outside of the discipline of anthropology, but also in the area of policy and politics. Indeed, her work extends anthropology into politics. Yet I would argue that she has remained an anthropologist to court 
and that she has not reduced anthropology nor herself to the anthropology of the senses. As I already mentioned, Sirimitaka's work is to be read in the context of her biography, even though it could not be read as autoethnography. Our students have already made use of the work of Serimitakis. For example, one student from Brazil, Tami Guimares, a Brazilian master student of anthropology, wrote in her thesis, the work of Serimitakis on memory and the senses is informative for considering the interaction between sensorial experience, memory, and cultural perspectives. This is crucial for opening up a reflexive, self-reflexive, culturally and historically informed consideration of the senses. I would now like to evoke a few of the ethnographic details, which I think are standing out and are mentioned in her book that can inform the topics that our department wish to engage in namely living, making, and moving. And this is the way that she works through the book. And she adds with these ethnographic miniatures, she adds several theoretical implications. I would like to end my introduction and application of Sirimitaki's work to what we are doing in our department with a note on methodology. Serimitakis produces ethnographic miniatures, dialogical spaces where cultural phenomena and practices are conceived and analyzed as performative yet fragmented dynamics of and in everyday life. The everyday, Serimitakis implies, is made up of small and often invisible acts, atemporal rituals and small objects, collective memorials and invol involuntary twitches of the individual, individual body. At the same time, the everyday is that which resists and adapts rather than succumbs to the impact of macrological and homogenizing forces. And now I will give the floor to Professor Nadia Sirmitakus for the inaugural lecture 2022, Anthropology from the Borders of the Inside. Thank you. Most grateful indeed for your kind words and this very generous presentation of my work. It is an honor for me to be here, invited by colleagues whose work I've known and admired, to speak in a department of anthropology that in the European academic context makes a difference. I extend my thanks also to all of you present here today, especially to the students and future colleagues in anthropology. Anthropology means dialogue. As we know, the anthropologist lives to dialogue with others, human and non-human, present and absent, next door and far away. It is in and through dialogue that anthropologists co-construct social historical experience with these others. Especially today, in the era of increasingly porous boundaries between nations and cultures, understanding how the anthropological enacted interpersonal and cross-cultural dialogue and communication works is crucial. Any discourse on dialogue is a discourse on the borders. The border marks transitions in space and time. Thus, the anthropologist just like the historian, the archaeologist, the artist, and the poet, is a witness and a translator of the past and future to the present, of the inside to the outside, of the particular to the general. But in this 
bidirectional traversal of leaking borders, the anthropologist does not efface the margin of difference in the very act of crossing it. Today, that rigid inside-outside dichotomies based on race, gender and ethnicity are re-emerging in new ways, discourses of the border are of value and particularly those discourses that call into question the ahistorical rigidity of any border and foreground its malleability, its permeability. On the border, the anthropologist is swimming in and out of multiple temporalities as he or she witnesses modernities, pre-modernities and non-modernities that are often contemporaneous and journeys in various locales, foreign and familiar, rural and urban. Thus, the anthropologist recognizes that in this bidirectional traversal of leaking borders, communication, silent or vocal, requires the mastery and exchange of linguistic and extra-linguistic codes. For the anthropological dialogue is not simply a talk between equals, nor is it necessarily a talk with an external other, as, as dialogue is customarily understood and promoted by modern media particularly. It is a dialogue with an internalized other. It is a dialogue meant to dissenter. Being on the border, in other words, is being on that porous line between Eros and Thanatos, where Thanatos, that is death, here is the death of the self. But of course, knowledge from the border can also reshape everyday life. It allows new forms of life and social relations to emerge. And the anthropologist, by focusing on the borders of the everyday, captures such transformations in the making. Well, uh, this is a stance that developed out of my conscious and unconscious fieldworks over several years and locales, beginning with my long-term fieldwork in Inner Money of South Peloponnese, which has been since my main ethnographic referent. It was in that historical margin of Europe that I was taught the poesis of dialogue, that is the making of dialogue, and I internalized the dialogical technique of antiphony. I'll get to that. Let me first say that inner money was not originally my desired field site, let alone death rituals as a topic of my dissertation. I was rather young. I was in love and heading for Africa. After all, anthropology at the time meant the study of our culture and different others far from home for supposedly one lacked enough of a distance from one's own culture that would guarantee an objective study. Well, uh, this is a rather problematic view uh, today, for we know that ethnographic fieldwork is not simply a scientific experiment. The biographical history of the anthropologist, the researcher, right, mediates his or her fieldwork experience. And in my case, for instance, uh, this history included years of living in New York, um, uh, and living and working and studying, uh, not just as a tourist, in other words. It was one of my advisors, Stanley Diamond, who diverted my attention and cultivated my interest in that warfare society with its long history of state resistance. In fact, based on a paper I wrote on, on uh, these issues in one of his courses, he asked for answers that demanded further investigation. Well, that was a clever way to make me travel back home a couple of times. Now, looking back, I could say he was years ahead of his time. I am visioning then what much later came to be known as native or indigenous anthropology. In other words, third world people trained as anthropologists in the U.S. or other birthplaces of anthropology would go back for ethnographic fieldwork in their own cultures, 
uh, cultures which previously had been the object of study by Western elites. And uh, these literati now, in turn, could uh, enter in cross-national dialogues over the imposition of any ethnocentric imagery or theorizing on their cultures and societies. The goal was to decolonize the discipline and, of course, enrich its dialogical nature. Well, today the decolonizing project is back on the agenda worldwide. It's back. It's not new. But anthropology proper was not yet ready for that type of dialogue. Things began to change, as we know, the mid mid 80s with the, the, the critique of scientific anthropology by uh, James Clifford, Renato Rosaldo, Clifford Geertz and others. But it had a long way to go. So had I. When I embarked on fieldwork in Germany, my aim was to produce an objective socio-historical study of that European margin known mainly for its clan wars and feuds, its later heroic participation in national wars, etc. But like a good field worker, I was of course participating in people's everyday activities. And these included the, de the death rituals of women, which I was expected to attend and, and, and uh, to my misfortune, uh, quite frequently, uh, sometimes twice a week. For there are several rituals held over time for its individual death. Until one morning, as women heading for the next death ritual knocked at my door to, to join them, I woke up saying to myself, what the hell are you searching for? Here is your story. Being an anthropologist is often like being a detective. You may be looking for the culprit in one direction or place, but signs may lead you elsewhere, often in the opposite direction. The question is, are we open to receive the signs? And if we do receive them, are we willing to follow them at all costs? For the anthropological dialogue is not risk-free nor is anthropology a comforting discipline. Ethnography has always focused on the traumatic dimension of historical experience, and anthropology is the discipline that theorizes the traumatic as everyday life. To mind comes uh, Stanley Diamond's definition. Anthropology is the study of people in crisis by people in crisis. Today, I think that our present is marked by multiple crises, multiple traumatic events, such as physical disasters, wars, terrorism, austerity, global epidemics. And as these traumas violate our social and personal lives, bodies and lives, and foster a realization of our vulnerability, this definition stated decades ago seems most appropriate. If American anthropologists' reaction was that my project in Inner Money was rather destined to fail, well, Greek academics' reaction was similar, though for different reasons. And by academics here, I mean mainly folklorics, folklorists and sociologists, for anthropology was unknown at the time. What is there to find in inner money now? It's all gone, I was told categorically. I can't quite tell what kept me going. Perhaps my realization uh, or intuition that in neocolonial formalist cultures such as Greek culture, uh, the cultural anthropological theories and method would make a difference, and they did. But what mostly struck me as peculiar at the time, was this discourse on loss. And it became a matter for exploration in my later ethnographic works. In other words, what had been lost, which is to say it had become a thing of the past. How can cultural experience be described as lost when in reality, uh, 
it's recent and, and uh, memory is still alive. How can something become non-visible in the present, although it is out there in our surroundings? What does this stance say about our conception of the past as well as the present? Is the past a completed, fixed entity to be treated as an isolatable, consumable unit of time, lacking thus any transformative capacity in the present? And is the present lacking any dy dynamic relation to its history? Or perhaps past and present being mutually incomplete allow for a dialogue between them? Likewise, is the everyday and ongoing flow of a historical time, just interrupted here and there by sensational events, uh, for instance, a war or a declaration of war, to what extent this perception renders the everyday detail meaningless and thus non-visible? Well, the answers came gradually through fieldwork for ethnographic fieldwork produces theoretical knowledge as much as theoretical knowledge is a prerequisite for fieldwork. Well, having decided on studying those death rituals finally, <laughs> or rather the locals decided for me, I searched for the existing literature and all I found was endless collections of improvised laments by local folklorists and historians in an effort to salvage a vanishing culture. Well, I was wondering, is my role as an anthropologist simply to salvage? Laments were, in this context, collected on the basis of the quality of content and were compared and contrasted to modern urban poetry. Thus, they were interpreted as psychological acts of creation and or as a relief from pain. Renato Rosaldo's words instead began to echo in my mind. Quote, Before you can narrate or tell stories about other cultures, about other ways of life, we must learn how the participants of these cultures narrate their own life. End of quote. To put it differently, how do they claim their own truth? And by what media? For what matters to anthropologists is not just the content of the truth claim, that is what is said, in this case, in the lament, but how truth is constructed. For it is that how that brings us to the domain of cultural practice. So I focused on how the improvised poetry, the laments, was produced in that society. Uh, it was produced in the death ritual, which gradually was revealed to me as the central site for the production and reproduction of dialogical discourse in that culture. I was witnessing a dialogue from below, based on performative media that allowed for communal participation. Well, thanks to my interdisciplinary training, known as the four-field approach in anthropology, I could see immediately that those dialogues produced in the ritual had nothing to do with the Socratic Platonic dialogue, for instance, which is a monological reflection and often takes place in a private space, but rather had a lot to do with the dialogical performance of ancient Greek tragedy, the tragic poets. Uh, just to remind us here, the dialogical performance of tragedy was public, collective, and participatory. It was a technique that aimed at interrogating the polis itself, impelling it to develop a self-reflexive relationship to its own ethics, politics, and history. It was a critique and an example of freedom of expression. But those women of contemporary Greece in inner money gradually showed me that their dialogical performance was not just a communication of the present or of the moment, as it is said of ancient tragedy, but it constructed memory. In other words, the improvised poetry for the dialogical expression of contrasting views, which was produced in the death ritual, 
was later transmitted to the rest of the society as oral history. So the dialogical antiphony was a technique for critiquing, historicizing, and remembering. Now in a parenthesis here, in Greek the concept of antiphony possesses a social and juridical sense in addition to uh, the aesthetic, musical, and dramaturgical uses that we usually are familiar with. Antiphony can refer to the creation of a symphony by op opposing voices, but it also implies echo, response, and guarantee. In Greek, the prefix anti does not only refer to opposition and antagonism, as in English, but also to equivalence in place of reciprocity face to face so for example a representative is called in greek antiprosopos where prosopo means face well in their laments those women use precisely the expressions allow me to come out as representative of the dead or allow me to witness the dead in short Dialogics or antiphony was unfolding to me, not as a talk between equal partners or between the self and an external other, but as a dialogue between the self and an internalized other, the absent other. Those women did not enter the ritual as atomized, traumatized victims to lament as a way of relieving their pain, but to witness the absent other and the dead. And they um, uh, left empowered because their ritual was not simply an expressive and momentary practice. It was the site in which gendered logos was legitimized and it had an interventionist role in society. To have the right to witness in that ritual the lamenter had to have past commensal history that is shared substance with the dead. So they said, allow me, for we grew up with one food, one water. To have her discourse granted us true and valid by the chorus of women, she had to properly display pain. Pain, that is, which was withheld and endured for long and valued as social work in that culture was now externalized. So performance is, is elicited here from within and externality. Witnessing thus, which is usually identified with language, was in fact an embodied performance, a truth claiming through the body, an exchange of emotions and memories. As I wrote uh, then in my first ethnography, Discoursed pain and discourse in pain constitutes truth in that culture. The validity and truth of one's discourse was granted or denied by the chorus of women through linguistic and bodily responses. In other words, pain to be true had to be socially constructed in antiphonic relations. It had a dual character. Women clearly stated that they could not properly mourn, that is, reach the proper emotional intensity, without the presence and help of others. So helping refers to a complex system of social exchange in which individual grief was but one component. Antiphony is an extension of the ethic of helping. It became clear to me that the only way by which I or any anthropologist could enter into that space of death was thus to enter as a member of the chorus, as a witness with contractual obligations. The ethnographer as witness had to obey the local antiphonic rules for the production of truth. In other words, I was to function as another for quality of concordance and in this role facilitate the construction and dissemination of social memory. We see that um, a return to historically actual models, to margins like that of 
for instance, of inner money, a return, that is, to established ethnographic practices can inspire and often provide answers, if not solutions, to current theoretical issues and debates. Debates that, uh, in cultural studies and media studies, and other disciplines, tend to center on Western, modern, urban societies and cultures, and predominantly on the domain of literature and the arts. So consider, for instance, uh, the debate on subjectivity and emotions, most popular today. Mm -hmm. Both of these in inner money were constructed through ritual performance. Yes, a large part of it was linguistic, but emotions and language were inseparable there. And that's unlike the Western conception of emotions and subjectivity as separate from law, for instance, which is the objective language. In that culture, pain had a dual character. Um, that realization, uh, you understand, uh, certainly threw me into the unknown. I mean, I had gone there with my own objective biases. Indeed, in anthropology, dialogues with the other are dialogues that decenter. As Michael Tausing would say, a second contact with the other is electroshocking. It is a shocking disruption, quote, to the neat and tidy categories of European perceptual hegemony, end of quote. So, one such category of our uh, modern secular society, coming back now to modernity, right, is literality which is contrasted to the, uh, the, the, the to metaphor and metaphorization, that is, which is an act and, and, and process of symbolizing. Hmm? This, in fact, in neocolonial peripheries, Greece, for example, has come to mean the opposite of modernization. Literality and desemantization are closely tied to realism, the cult of the thing itself. And I'm afraid we live in the era of the cult of realism. When it comes, for instance, to sensory affective experiences, we tend to favor scientific, uh, medicalized, and legalistic discourses. These are all modes of realism. But those women instead would connect through the ethic of care and reciprocity their different everyday practices by metaphorizing one in the other, weaving them into an experiential continuum. And I mean, all their separate works, like their work in the field, their improvised poetry, their dreaming, burial and exhumation of the dead, etc., etc. Through metaphorization, that is, they created a synthesis, which was not a psychological act of creation, but a sensory affective performance with a chorus of others that could be humans, frogs, birds, trees, objects, stones, anything, in an antiphonic dialogue that would turn any individual pain, loss, or death into a collective public event. And, and this, uh, as a matter of fact, pertained not only to humans, but also to a landscape. So the lament as storytelling and oral history restores this reciprocity, extending it in time. This is the poetics of the margin, of the border, or the so-called periphery. Poesis in Greek means both making and imagining. Thus the poetics of the margin, its social imaginary, is always a material culture, which includes the material world of talking objects, or what I have talked, I have uh, termed talking objects. Um, this is what an anthropologist would be expected to recover, but not because periphery or the margin is the place that fragments are to be nostalgically recovered or as ancient relics, but in order to be rewoven 
in an, as anti-modernity. You see, they had just taught me and all of us how to put together, how to construct an ethnography, be that textual or beyond text. That is how to synthesize fragments. But I admit that the realist perception of the object as given was definitely challenged for me in and during exhumation rituals, which, by the way, I was allowed to attend much, much later when they felt I was ready to go deeper into their reality. Every bone exhumed was also a word of the lament, and every word a bone. There I was taught that some objects are not utilitarian things, that objects are diachronic stratigraphies of social and personal experience, and having been invested with sensory memory, they can talk. Can we dialogue with them? Bones, like all objects, are not immutable, they're not static, they're transformed in and through time. This journey through time defamiliarizes them, of course. Now, by hand touching them, now, the exhumer feels their journey in time from past to present. Like uh, a good archaeologist, perhaps, would do. I say perhaps because archaeology is turning into a positive science itself these days. But these bones belong to a person, a significant other. They are but an epigraphic witness of the absent other, brought forth defamiliarized from the depths of forgetfulness and history. This defamiliarizing meeting is thus a meeting with our past. Well, this existential encounter with the finding cannot be found in our written history or in our conceptual constructions, actually. It belongs to a dense logos that expresses the unspeakable. Back again to modernity. You see, one such paradigmatic object, a talking object, which is central material object in modernity, is the cinematic screen, cinema. Hmm? Susan Buck Morse, the philosopher, speaks of it as a prosthetic organ. For the French-Swiss influential filmmaker of the post-war era, Jean-Luc Godard, too, the cinema screen is an organ of memory, a repository of sensory history. In his um, well-known uh, uh, eight-part film, L'Histoire du Cinéma, he undermines the literal contemporaneity of the cinema screen by showing what? It's, it's archaeological depths. Every image, in other words, is both memory and reinvention of earlier images and events. Through montage, he shows each cinematic image grounded in a stratigraphy of earlier imagery. Now, the moment he watches his own memory on screen is a moment of self-reflexivity, a central concept of our discipline. You see, uh, cinema viewing in the past entailed an outpouring of emotions, a dialogue with the screen. As I said in the past, as a matter of fact, I, I, uh, I often dialogue with the screen, uh, TV screen. Um, I applaud if I like something, etc. Uh, it, in other words, it was not perceptual naivete in the past that uh, caused audiences to flee when they first saw um, on coming on screen a train, for example. The everyday life of the audience was articulated with the on-screen image, and the audience retooled this imagery as they retooled cinema into organ of their own social memory, as opposed, I mean, to, to receiving cinema, cinematic uh, imagery as a replacement of their own. So an eloquent example, I think, of this uh, was the film uh, uh, Cinema Paradiso. 
As Stoller has also pointed out, it took transformation of the senses for people to apprehend the cinema screen. And, and uh, I would add, by extension, there was also a disciplinary socialization of the body. Um, back to the present. Yes, earlier relationships of dialogue gradually disappear. The media, TV particularly, one of modernity's principal constituent forces, simulate dialogue in monological forms and leave the audience as passive spectator of the process, or dialogue is simply sold as a commodity to be consumed by those who are barred from it. Um, we often sense that we exist in a pseudo-culture of sameness and in an era of generalized consensus. The problem, therefore, for anthropologists today is to re-establish new terms of the dialogical that presuppose difference and discontinuity, not uniformity and continuity, globality and the transnationalized. Anthropologists are in a unique position to do that, I think, because of their long exploration of cross-cultural and historical difference. A difference we anthropologists, of course, explore not for touristic consumption, but in order to lead us to a reflection on our present. And today this is very uh, important, politically important, for it points to an alternative mediology of everyday life, which is now experienced as colonized by public media. Um, anthropology has plenty of such examples of asymmetrical and disjunctive dialogics. One such example, for instance, I presented here earlier, which addresses also, addressed also the, the, the issue of memory and its materiality. Such examples expand the terms and content of dialogue, for they are opposed to the ahistorical rigidity of any border. Um, I'm thinking, for instance, of um, the nationalist narrative or an event history, uh, which does just the opposite, that is, uh, um, uh, limit the terms and content of dialogue. Hmm? In the culture I discussed uh, today, dialogue was inseparable from pain and memory. So do we witness and claim truth today with pain and memory? Rather not. Those women, for example, entered social interiors from an outside, and yet their logos opened borders rather than confirming them in their rigidity. It is for this reason that they historicized from the position of death, which is historicizing at the limits of the inside, from a site of absence and the without. They used marginalized and heterotopic memory of shared substance and reciprocity to challenge the public order of space itself. The question is, how is memory used today to respond to social crisis? Well, today the displacement of local memory becomes a visible threat. Illness, pain and death become part of the medical and economic establishments. Neighborhoods and streets are taken over by drug dealing and violent ethnic killings. Suicide rates and missing people increase, but at the same time, a close ethnographic look at everyday life and practices reveals our increasing social need to create memory spaces, to protect domestic history, our inside. We see, for example, increasing deprivatizing gestures like graffiti, selfies, uh, Facebook, and the street memorials in, in Greek um, urban and rural areas, or road shrines uh, elsewhere in the world, like USA and Latin America, 
and plenty of other everyday intervention practices. During my recent field work, particularly on these um, uh, non-institutional street memorials, which I called uh, uh, street graves, uh, that defied all state interventions and spatial surveillance and which emerged and multiplied like mushrooms in contemporary urban scapes in the era of austerity, I witnessed people's need for new forms of reminiscence, forms that are disjunctive to the museumification of memory promoted by the historical monument, the museum, or the archaeological site. Uh, as well as, uh, I would say, the academic study that often turns memory to a sheer pool of ideas. Uh, the construction of these um, street memorials, or what uh, Deserteau would call pedestrian speech acts, reclaim the symbolic use of the space and, moreover, revealed new modes of understanding politics, of belonging, of practicing citizenship rights in public space, and much more. These rather thanatopolitical, then, street acts remind us that looking at life through the optic of death can offer us new insights on life itself. We must, therefore, search for the ways memory is used in everyday life to respond to social crisis, to look for alternative memory which must be salvaged. But, as I said earlier, the role of anthropology is simply to salvage? No. Ethnography as both method and text or beyond text must provide alternative affectivities. We must look for and into cultures or social groups they have developed indigenous self-reflexive practices that cultivate rupture and discontinuity in everyday modern life. Practices that tend to be ignored or unconsciously rendered collateral losses. Ethnography has always focused on everyday life experiences for the first casualty of any crisis or of any traumatic history is everyday life as a stable, predictable structure. Anthropology is the discipline that theorizes the traumatic as everyday life. And its merit, I think, lies in the fact that it focuses on the perceptual detail of everyday life, usually unnoticed by conventional and sociological philosophical optics. The turn to everyday life as a historical and cultural resource is politically important and necessary, especially, I would say, in neocolonial societies where formalism uh, looms large and discourses of loss and social crisis are an integral part of the political logic of mimetic modernization. Traumatic history is productive. It gives rise to new forms of everyday life, documents people me making meaning and identity uh, in the aftermath of displacement, violence, separation, exile. And my uh, understanding of trauma or wound here is, is, of course, far from a mere symptom of an underlying pathology or a visible injury caused by an external force, which demand a therapeutic catharsis, like in medicine, for instance. Uh, it here speaks instead about long historical experiences, open wounds that travel through time and via bodies, individual and social, national and global, and congeal into a collective memory. The recalling of this memory in action, in fact, was what we witnessed, I think, very recently in the streets of Athens and elsewhere, where locals and invading others, immigrants or refugees, met in affective exchanges. These outsiders, like ghosts from the past, 
re-emerged from the borders, awakening unconscious history into traumatic consciousness. <clears throat> but this we also witnessed much earlier, in the 80s and 90s, uh, when the first Albanian economic migrants to the European Union arrived. Uh, as I wrote then, Europe appeared to me to be seized by its own borders. Cultural identity shifted from the metropole and from conventional cultural uh, uh, heritage sites to the borders, from Acropolis or the museum to the borders. These encounters also reveal, and this is very important, that there are still various paradigms of pain coexisting. You see, the transpersonal allegorical concept of pain that we encountered in Inner Money was also now present in the modern urban centers. Thus, if an anthropologist chooses to see it as a relic of the past, then most likely he or she will be dismissing and silencing, uh, that is turning non-visible, hmm, the presence of social and linguistic codes of social intimacy in everyday urban life itself. Well, all these issues um, also concern us more today for they speak to anthropologists' recent concerns about the, its public performance, its general interface with the public, for broadening its audiences within and beyond academic space. So the question arising, how is this to be accomplished? For any designing and organization of public dialogical terrains is but the translation of one's sociocultural theorization. Indeed, anthropology needs to broaden its audiences. We do need the public anthropology, but does broadening of our audiences imply an insertion of the discipline also into a dominant politics of generalized consensus? Or should ethnographers remain reporters in disagreement, which is a prerequisite for dialogics, you see. Some believe, for instance, that being in the media, anthropology will attract audiences. But how is this to occur? It's good to be in the media, yes. But what events and experiences need to be audited and narrated? We often hear advices given by scholars, uh, recently by AAA, American Anthropological Association, as well, that um, uh, one way, for, in, for example, to be published in the media is to choose newsworthy subjects. But do anthropologists and media reporters concur on significance when it comes to newsworthiness? I hope not. An important disagreement lies here. Ethnographic perception and imagination is and should be, I think, qualitatively different from media perception, and this difference should be voiced. Yes, reportage is witnessing. But the witnessing of the media is not antiphonic, it is appropriative. The media do not witness to archive, for they are not interested in creating a public history memory. This is contrasted, for example, uh, with the traditional death rituals I discussed earlier, where there was a need to archive to create collective social memory out of the singularity of each death and pain. Uh, modern media instead uh, fixate, I would say, on singularity, on the idiosyncrasy of the event to report gaps in everyday life, for they see rapture in everydayness. I recall um, one dramatic evening after wildfires um, in Greece that a major TV channel assumed the uh, the role of a national collective space, given the uh, lack of government presence, 
people, of course, were turning to media to manage risk. But a lot of people also were confronting TV ethics of witnessing. Thus, the media's fragmentation of time into discrete episodes. And they feared precisely that this event, too, would be uh, next day covered up by another, so erased. Another point of our disagreement with the media lies in, in, in the dominant models of the media, which are based on the division between reportage and evaluation. The fieldwork ethic, instead, as established early by Boisian anthropology, ideally abolishes the division between theorist and field worker. In a dialogical anthropology, ethnographic fieldwork presupposes theoretical knowledge and theories derived from fieldwork. That's why fieldwork takes time. It's not just a touristic stroll. So I contend that an ethnography regrounded on a spatial relation residence, uh, in the sense of dwelling, of experiencing, mm, and on a temporal relation, long-term fieldwork experience, that is, would transform tourism into historicism. And I have proposed for the future a public anthropology based on the uh, uh, discourse and knowledge of those who dwell at the border of uh, social and historical disaster. Cultural otherness is thus defined by the experience of traumatic history, the experience of radical displacement in terms of time and space. Whether one is a migrant to a new country, has become part of a diaspora that has been created through uh, traumatic history, such as uh, a war, famine, uh, forced uh, removal, uh, um, ethnic cleansing, uh, austerity, or has experienced disaster and death as terrorism or natural disaster, such as an earthquake or fire. Well, somebody might ask, are there alternative ways to make anthropology known beyond academia other than uh, reporting to the media? For reporting to the media quite often means that uh, the anthropologist simply becomes their informant. To put it differently, are there other ways to make ethnography a public resource <coughs> and ethnographic fieldwork a valuable pedagogical tool? Do we have examples of this? Can we create examples? For the dialogical nature of ethnography and its performance calls for an interface between theory and practice. Well, I will draw again on a case of the past. This is a, lo this is a, uh, a discipline with a long history, didactic and inspiring. Mid-90s, the term public anthropology had not been invented yet. Now I'm invited by the authorities of a small town of South Peloponnese to organize a public commemorative event for a devastating earthquake that hit the town 10 years earlier. Physical disasters were not as frequent at the time, so earthquake was perceived as an isolated event that stigmatized the particular area and probably would inhibit its uh, tourism. And the intent of official commemorations, as usual, was catharsis and resolution. Now, was I interested in staging an official commemoration as ex expected uh, by local authorities? Rather not. I was interested instead in the popular and spontaneous ways in which the people recorded the events of the earthquake in other words, what strategies, practices, and materials, what media they used to preserve or to recover the past and the immediate present of the disaster, both destroyed by the earthquake. So a participatory public event was well on its way, which would include um, a public exhibition, 
to reenact the process by which the people reassembled their lives and their city from the fragments made by the disaster. Hundreds of objects of memory, talking objects, were brought by the citizens for the occasion. Objects full of memory, fragments from domestic interiors of no economic value, such as ancestral photographs, an antique phonograph or an old photo of the city square, etc. Objects that they had saved all those years by chance or intent. Objects of the heart, talking objects that in themselves represented small triumphs over the attack on memory and identity afflicted by the disaster. So these generous, uh, the donations of course, for the event was the outcome of a long process of cultural mobilization. It was preceded and made possible by creating relations of trust, dialoguing, providing on the ground rapid education with the citizens and discussing over coffees and coffees and coffees their emotional ties with these objects. Applying, in other words, anthropological theory and method. And, and uh, not simply uh, call via public media, for instance, for volunteers to bring objects and expecting people to respond, which is usually how it's done by uh, state cultural institutions. So these objects hidden in private space and private memory, collected and curated by the citizens themselves, when brought out from their isolation in their respective homes and linked and presented together, created public history. They were private objects embodying private experiences, memories and emotions previously not represented in public, uh, which were now uh, placed and staged in the exhibit hall next to the public official record of the earthquake, such as scientific uh, instruments, reports, uh, films, recordings of uh, mediatic and of scientific and governmental institutions. The transformation of private and privatized memory into public history occurred through the material vehicles of objects. Some survivors by chance or intent had rescued them um, as if such antique objects would replenish the temporal continuity and stability that the quake had ruptured. Uh, they used these artifacts to search for threads through time, to lead them out of the labyrinth of disaster and destruction. Well, that was not a psychological approach, you see. This mobilization of memory, the creation of a participatory museum of the present, bear witness to culture in process and to participants as social actors in the process. So participants use the exhibit as a vehicle to recognize their relation to a traumatic and silenced past. It, it also made a point that the cultural events and dynamics are part of everyday life and not divorced from it. Hundreds of citizens visited uh, their objects in public spaces, uh, spaces uh, that they had not uh, visited before. Um, especially kids and elderly people visited and revisited their objects. Um, it was like a statement, I want to be remembered in public. So this is an example, you see, of intervention performance practices in everyday life, just as the installation of uh, street memorials by citizens, which I mentioned earlier, both aiming at countering the sensory affective divestiture of trauma spaces and bodies. Many more interventions must be witnessed and documented in everyday life. Anthropologists have a lot of work to do. 
uh, it is important that, that, that they utilize fieldwork methodology and ethics in order to stand as an, an antiphonic response to dominant models in the media, which are based on the division between reportage and evaluation. Um, unfortunately, this is the model now um, adopted also by state institutions, academia included, I uh, would say, and international four active in the domain of culture, and then they often refer to it as the ethnographic approach. Well, it's not. To recapitulate, anthropology is indeed a unique field of study with a long history, and it has always dealt with a traumatic dimension of historical experience. In fact, I would say that its future lies in its past. Well, in our seismic present, as an African saying goes, the future is predictable. What is unpredictable is the past. The existential structure of the present mediates our perception of history to the extent that the past yes, is endlessly pumping out meanings and consequences for the present. Besides, the situation of late modernity and transnational conditions also permit new dialogical relations with the past since the present is altered. Today, uh, we have uh, technology, though, somebody might add, uh, yeah, oh, yes, we do, uh, and thank God. Uh, when I did my first ethnography, my first research, uh, you were very lucky if you had a little camera to take a few photos. Uh, and if you did, <laughs> uh, I remember having battles with my publisher and editor to uh, manage to have a mini photo album at the end of the uh, ethnography. Um, we do have new technologies that uh, allow for more freedom of expression, uh, institutional constraints that uh, have retained uh, certain ways of representing culture are more openly challenged uh, today. And um, also today we speak of various ways of doing ethnography. Uh, we speak of audio, visual, um, multimodal, collaborative ethnographies, graphic anthropology, and so much more to expand di disciplinary boundaries. But one issue remains, and that is that in any system or act of representation, the issue is who controls the means to represent and how these means are undermined. Furthermore, my question is, are, are all these new ways of doing ethnography, of producing knowledge in anthropology, are as brand new as they appear or claim to be? Uh, or most of them almost have been long anticipated. Uh, they were just uh, not given mega names then. So we have to remember that um, the eternal return of the new is the logic of commodification, that is the displacement of the old and reproduction of the new as novelty, which leads to an erasure of public memory. But ethnography has never been static to begin with, you see. Since Boas's holistic approach, ethnography has been subjected to multiple critics from within the field itself and has undergone changes more than uh, any other discipline, I would say, in the humanities and social sciences. Uh, the anthropology I was trained in, for example, back in the 80s, was already interdisciplinary, and it experimented with various methods and styles of writing. Um, my own advisor, I remember, was also a poet, 
And at the new school, we were taught ethnopoetics, that is the study of literary traditions of indigenous cultures. Uh, it was a collaborative field by the poets uh, Jerome Rothenberg and Gary Snyder, anthropologists like uh, Dennis Tedlock and Stanley Diamond, uh, the sociolinguist and folklorists, folklorists uh, De uh, Del Himes, uh, all influential figures in their fields. And all this was also occurring in, in a general context of discussions and debates as to whether ethnography is a scientific method or literature or both, and whether writing was the only medium of representation. Trained in that critical tradition myself, um, as early as in the 90s, I critiqued uh, Lévi-Strauss in my classes in New York. Uh, but for his, well, I admit young people who have some guts sometimes. <laughs> um, I critiqued him for his evolutionist bias, which led him to the ethnocentric depiction of the Amazonian tribe Nambiquara as a tribe that does not write. It just draws lines he ethnocentrically stated in his well-known essay, A Writing Lesson, and went on to conclude that societies without writing are also societies without history. Um, the critique and disagreement then was that he failed to recognize their drawing as their form of writing and as a record of their social relations, <laughs> that is, of history. Because, I mean, history is a written record of social experience and relations, no? Uh, and, and if their writing is not a writing, well, what about the Chinese? Well, um, another example, you see, I can recall a joint ethnographic project between um, an anthropologist and, 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 photo and a photographer um, entitled uh, Death Rituals in Rural Greece. Uh, published as early as 1982. It was what we would call today visual and or collaborative anthropology. Um, I remember teaching it uh, as an example in the negative. That is what anthropological dialogues should not be, or as an example of non-dialogue between a photographer and uh, his subjects, as well as between an anthropologist and a photographer. So, for instance, one of the pictures uh, portrayed in, in that ethnography uh, uh, showed a, a principal female uh, mourner uh, exhuming the bones of a relative and um, uh, an old lady uh, has picked up the skull and is holding it with tender care in her palm. You understand, in, in, in view of this, the photographer, uh, an urban American, obviously experienced uh, uh, cultural shock and disorientation and grabbed his camera to capture the grotesquerie of death. But it was at that moment that the old lady turned her head to face him and with all the didactic and ironic double meanings of a rural person when confronting social conflict, she said to him, that's how your parents, but also you yourself, will become one day. So w what type of witnessing was taking place there? The photographer was up for a visual, uh, purely visual representation. And the mourner is as if telling him, you're taking your photo? Well, here is mine. That's your media? Here is my media. He was dematerializing with his photos. She was rematerializing with the bones. So you see, there are media that decontextualize and media that recontextualize. The time structure also is interesting. You see, he was taking pictures of the past, that's visual documentation. She was taking pictures of the future. You will become like this tomorrow. So she's telling him 
how to look at things, how he should look at things. Informants always point to the significant detail. You just have to listen. Be attentive to how the other sees, in other words, what mode of representation the other uses. So the particular ethnography uh, was problematic, uh, I thought, because the anthropologist interpreted the photographer's perception as concurring with his own perception and that of the local mourners. Uh, it was his inability to acknowledge the anti-anthropological perception of the photographer and to stand himself as a reporter in disagreement that undermined the validity of his ethnography. See. Of course, uh, different examples of visual and collaborative ethnographies came uh, 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 much later, and, and uh, a great example of a constructive dialogue between an anthropologist and a photographer came much later with Philip de Boeck's eloquent ethnography, Kinshasa, published in 2004, among others. So, to conclude, inserting anthropology to the dominant politics of generalized consensus, which reduces dialogics to a talk between equal partners, means losing history. Losing history is losing place. Place defined by its human and non-human content and activity is crucial in and for the dialogical process. In other words, to engage in an antiphonic dialogue, that is to address the other, one has to have an address a place himself. The creation of a distinct space, a place, is a prerequisite for witnessing, witnessing others and be witnessed by others. So if anthropologists lose place, therefore, they run the risk to become in and out of academia infrapolitical, liminal, that is, homeless, just like the victims of wildfires among, around the world who, having their home destroyed, undergo a condition of flexible citizenship in their own nation-state. The question, therefore, remains for all of us, especially so for this audience of students and aspiring anthropologists, will we choose to insert ourselves to the dominant politics of generalized consensus, leading to homogenization, and usually uniformity is often replaced by conformity, or will we remain reporters in disagreement? Well, I love my home anthropology, so I vote for the latter. Thank you.